got a PhD in sociocultural anthropology, who's currently the strategy and design consultant as well, is a strategy and design consultant as well, currently as executive in residence at Rotten School of Management here at the University of Toronto. Also very happy to welcome Graham Candy, uh, who has a master's degree in sociocultural anthropology and is currently a partner and chief strategy officer at Angry Butterfly. I'm um, looking forward to hearing more about uh, his work as well as Dr. Clark, Aiken Clark's work. Letha Victor, uh, a graduate, a PhD uh, of the uh, graduate of the Uni University of Toronto Anthropology Department, sociocultural anthropology. She works for the Canadian government. She's a policy analyst for, uh, for Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Um, really, uh, the government's going to be around for a while. So here, she's uh, an, an excellent example as a person for kinds of careers you can find outside of academia. And finally, Joseph or Joey Youssef, uh, who's a doctorate in sociocultural anthropology, who's a behavioral strategist for an organization called Evoke Micromass. Uh, all four of these panelists are going to be here to answer you all's questions, but also give very, very brief, I suppose, presentations about their developmental arc uh, and how they were able to make the best advantage of their anthropology background. I was talking with Walter just a second ago and I mean, it's crazy. It seems that almost because of his anthro background, there's just been this sort of embarrassment of riches of all of these people that sort of once you get in the pipeline as an anthro person, then then it seems that there are certain pipelines when all of a sudden you get tapped for a bunch of different stuff, which can be really wonderful. And certainly uh, to the degree that I like anthropology, I'm glad that anthropologists are out in the world doing this stuff. Um, without further ado, however, I'm going to bid you my leave and turn the turn the table over to or turn the give the floor over to Walter Callahan, who's got the, will uh, share the land acknowledgement with us and otherwise welcome and get the get the situation kicked off. Thanks you all for showing up. Um, thank you, the panelists for taking time out of your day and your very busy schedules to come meet with us on a Friday afternoon uh, and share some of your stuff with us. So thanks for organizing your schedules in order to make this work. Um, and I'm just really grateful. Thanks a lot, let's get this going. All right. Hopefully I'm recording this properly. I've it never is. actually had to do the thing on recording, so hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to find it afterwards as well. Uh, so to start off, uh, of course, we, we do a land acknowledgement, a very important thing for us here. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. If you're joining us from somewhere other than the University of Toronto, feel free to place in your own acknowledgement in the chat. That is always a welcome thing as well. Uh, to start off, uh, so we've got a, a packed house here with, with four great former academics who have gone on into the private or public sphere. Great to have you all here. Uh, we will start off with, I think the best way of doing it is to have each of you give a little introduction of what your background in anthropology was, how and why you made the switch over to either the public or the private sphere, and what you're doing now in that sphere and how, 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 you, how you see yourself as an anthropologist in those roles that you currently have. Uh, so just going in the order that I've wrote down names as you joined, First, first in, <laughs> first gets to go. So I'll, I will hand it over to you for we are, I think maybe seven to ten minutes for for this round of who you are, what you do. Sure. Did you say me? Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Um, I clearly did not get a PhD in listening skills. Um, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Letha Victor. Um, I got my PhD in sociocultural anthropology in twenty eighteen. Um, my fieldwork um, was uh, based in northern Uganda, um, where I did research for uh, off and on for about a dozen years. And uh, I am actually still publishing uh, on some of that work. I've got a couple pieces coming out this year. So it is also possible um, to, you know, still maintain connections. Technically, I am an adjunct at U of T uh, as well, because uh, I was kind of interested in keeping a toe in that world. But my day to day uh, is uh, with the government of Canada. Canada. So, um, uh, yeah, my research um, has primarily focused on the social effects of war uh, and trauma, broadly defined. Uh, and I've looked at the intersections of health and religion uh, on um, basically social change um, after uh, mass displacement. 
uh, human rights abuses, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So um, uh, when I was coming out of U of T, I actually took an academic path. I was very, very fortunate. I had, um, uh, I suppose, horseshoes up my bottom is uh, a way that I could uh, phrase it, is that um, I was offered a tenure track job um, uh, ABD. And uh, I moved from Toronto to North Carolina uh, in 2018. Uh, and I was an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina. Um, the pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of stuff was happening in North Carolina, in the United States, uh, at that university in particular, um, that were really difficult for me personally, uh, as well as professionally. Um, and I you know, I kind of uh, came to the realization that um, I was really, really unhappy um, and that uh, I felt like academia for me was like a space of de deferred happiness. You know, when I finish my PhD, I'll be happy. When I get uh, a tenure track job, I'll be happy. When I get tenure, I'll be happy. Um, and then all of a sudden you're dead and <laughs> you've never been happy. And so I, um, I decided uh, to do something else. Um, so I was, uh, again, really fortunate. I applied to a, a program uh, called the Recruitment of Policy Leaders, uh, which is a Government of Canada program that uh, recruits um, academics, uh, including lawyers, especially lawyers, there's so many lawyers, um, who uh, have interest or experience in policy, broadly speaking, uh, and uh, and kind of place them in, in various positions across, across government. So uh, once again, I was extremely fortunate to get into that program. Um, and I pulled the plug uh, on my job in North Carolina and I, I moved home to Vancouver uh, where I am on the traditional uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So um, I am a policy analyst uh, in refugee affairs, particularly, uh, specifically uh, international protection policy. Um, so uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, my team liaises between, we're the government liaisons with the United Nations High Commissioner, High Commissioner for Refugees, um, particularly around diplomatic issues to do with refugee protection uh, and forced displacement. So um, that can mean anything from um, writing briefing notes for senior management and government um, to um, doing consultations with civil society. Uh, I'm currently leading a project um, that's trying to mainstream uh, refugee participation in, in the production of policy uh, and in the implementation of programs. So I spend a lot of my time um, talking to former refugees uh, and other people with lived experience of forced displacement, um, trying to uh, kind of uh, solicit their views and ideas about how um, government can be more inclusive of, of the voices of people who have actually um, lived those experiences or are currently living them. So um, that's kind of the long and short of it. I'm sure there's much, much more I can um, talk about uh, in that end. But overall, I would say, um, you know, I'm very happy with um, the decision to make the shift. Um, uh, you know, even though there is some, there is certainly a sense of loss um, when it comes to leaving, you know, a pure academic position. And there's things that I really miss about um, being Professor Victor. Um, now I'm just, you know, policy analyst X, Y, Z. Um, uh, I have a much, much healthier relationship to work. Um, uh, a really important thing is that I would say that um, my career isn't my whole identity, which I think it was um, when I was uh, in academia um, to a very unhealthy degree. Um, and I have a, a much, much better work-life balance, um, and uh, I actually get paid better <laughs> and have uh, better benefits. So um, ask me more. Anyways, I will stop talking and pass it on to somebody else. That was a great summary. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, for, for those who are joining in as well, uh, if you, questions come to your mind, you can always put them into, into the chat now. and. Once we're done this round of introductions, uh, we'll look and see if there are questions. Uh, if there aren't, I've got a few questions. Look at that mind. We'll, we'll have lots of time for questions after these introductions. So next, uh, Graham, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be doing what you're currently doing. Thanks, Walter. Um, 
Graham Candy. Um, I don't know why my only my first name showed up, but it makes it seem like I'm trying to be very cool. Um, but uh, so my background is um, what did I do? I did an undergrad at U of T, got really into anthro. I thought it would be a really fun way to uh, I thought it'd be a really good excuse to study video games, which is what I ended up doing for a long time because I was a, a, a gaming degenerate and played a lot of online games. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the only discipline that'll let me study video games legitimately without any technical skills. Um, so I did that for uh, I did a few projects in my undergraduate. Um, and then I went and did a master's at Concordia in this game studies lab through a connection with one of the professors at U of T. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, I studied how, how people build trust online and how trust is formed in online gameplay. And uh, it was really fun. I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was a, it was a fun cross-cultural thing that I did partly in China, partly in, in Canada. Um, and then I thought, okay, now I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go for the goal to get my PhD. So I came back to U of T, started my PhD and, uh, and got, I don't even know what year I got into five, maybe or something. I, I, I did the what we have some sort of equivalent of comps, right? In anthro, I don't know what it is. You do you, you do the the thing where you present the uh, your proposal. I, there we go. Thank you. I forgot the language now. So I did the proposal, you know, you do the defense of, of your proposal. And they say now you can go do your field work. And by that time, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so I got I, I was uh, I thought, I'm gonna I'm going to go out there in the in the world and see what's out there and keep doing my PhD at the same time. Um, and I was like, I can balance corporate life and academia. That was not the case. Um, so I I actually went into consulting first, which is um, research, research slash consulting, which is like one of the more natural transitions, I find, because you ha you're, you just have a bunch of research training skills through being in the social sciences for a long time. So people hire you. You can do interviews. You can talk to people. Um, you can make people comfortable in a situation and get to know them. So I, I, I did that for, um, three years or so. Uh, and, um, and through that, I got to work with some advertising agencies and I thought, oh, this is way cooler because, you know, there's a bunch of creative people here and they're making cool stuff and, um, you get to make commercials and social media is at the center of it and et cetera, et cetera. So, I hopped over to an advertising agency and that was uh crazy and uh unlike Letha, work life balance <laughs> went it went the other it went even went went the other way. Um, but I really enjoyed it. So that was the difference, I guess, which is which is whereas in academia I was starting to have a existential crisis about whether I wanted to do this anymore. Um, I just thrived for whatever reason in the in the uh consulting and then advertising space and although it was really crazy work and continues to be it was it was also just really fun because it changes all the time and that's where I was getting stuck in academia I was stuck I was doing the same thing and studying the same topic and I was on like year 12 of it and I was like I don't want to do this but I felt like I couldn't change at that point I couldn't just like pivot five years into my PhD into something new and I felt like I was going to have to complete something I didn't want to complete or go do something new so um, anyways, I spent a few years at different advertising agencies, met some really great, amazing people. And then, um, at the start of the pandemic, three of us, uh, left our, <laughs> exactly three of us, um, three of us quit our job at an advertising agency and we started a, a new one, angry butterfly. Like I'm so corporate, I got like swag on now and everything. Um, but, uh, we, we started a, our own marketing, uh, slash advertising agency. We also um, do analytics and um, we do research too, which is really fun. I still get to do research, which is really nice interviews and travel places and get to know people, but it's more off. It's more in like a one-off, you know, you do it for four to six months and you learn a whole bunch about a particular world. And then you deliver your report and you're like, cool, I'm going to go do something different now, <laughs> which I like. And, um, uh, and it's gone well, we're now we're 35 people. Like it's totally crazy. And, you know, I'm, uh, I've I was just joking the other day with with one of my colleagues that when I was a kid, my dad used to give me a subscription to a magazine called Adbusters. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. And now I run an ad agency, which is the inc incredible irony of the my dad is probably very disappointed, right? <laughs> but he's not. He's not. He's he's happy. But uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. I get to apply Anthro in, in my day to day in different ways. It's you know, it's not as hardcore as it was in academia, but I find I, I get to help give. Um, clients we work with a better, deeper perspective on their 
challenges because it's often very narrow and and in the business world they don't have time to think about what's going on in culture and uh things that have shifted and they, they don't they're not, they don't have time to read academic books and you know it's not their world and it's not that you can totally change their point of view on things but you can help broaden it and give them a deeper perspective on on what the impact of their work is and how they might be able to do a um have a have a better impact and um and here and there you have some victories and it's great so um but I think that's uh that's the 101 on me thank you very much for that uh, next on my list, I've got Joseph. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph, also known as Joey. Um, I went by Joey a lot. I mean, I think those who do know me know me as Joey. So uh, Joey, Joseph, anything, all is good. Um, I uh, I shared an office with Letha, uh, bestest of buddies. Um, and uh, we... Um, I, I, I finished shortly after Letha. I defended in 2018 um, and uh, convocated 2019. Um, a lot of things changed in my life during during that time, but I'll, I'll talk about my so what my my uh, my my dissertation was on Coptic Orthodox monasticism in Egypt and in California. Um, I I ended up doing a transnational project as a result of the the Egyptian Revolution in 2011 um and that sort of shifted the my my focus so it ended up becoming a bit transnational um so i um i i uh, i finished and quite frankly after i, I finished along with um, so that that year that i defended a lot of things happened i had um so getting into details i had some health issues um that sort of put a a strain kind of on my my ability to focus and to write and, and want to write um, and quite frankly, I just got super bored of, of my dissertation. Um, I'm going to be very <laughs> brutally honest. Um, you know, the dream, I think, uh, many of us come in to, to, you know, do our PhDs because we want to stay academics. Um, and that's, that's what I want to do that. I wanted to, to live that, um, live that, that dream, um, of, of, you know, getting tenure, uh, getting a tenure track position, you know, living that life of a professor, um, <clears throat> But I couldn't after after I, I I had major surgery after I had that surgery, um, I just couldn't write and I just wasn't motivated um, enough. Um, and I started dabbling in consulting as well, um, and 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 was able to to get uh, to get a gig from um, you know um, an opportunity. I had an opportunity from one of uh, um, our colleagues, um, also in anthropology, who who um, gave me an opportunity to do um, uh, some consulting. Um, in the financial uh, in this financial um, sphere, and I, I liked it. Um, you know, money was better, obviously, and that's another thing. I think I was also at a time where, um, in, in in my life, after I got you know came out of surgery, and my wife and I were were thinking of starting a family, and um, it just didn't make sense um, financially to stay in academia with on on one on one income. Um, and, um, you know, I was doing a bunch of adjunct stuff as well online and, and, and trying to, you know, do consulting where I could and, and, and little gigs here and there. Um, but that was, that was my reality, um, that, you know, just, um, I needed more stability, um, and I need to settle down. Um, and, um, that's sort of where I started getting into, I started applying to things online. Um, and quite, quite frankly, up until while when I started, I still had that identity crisis of between wanting to stay an academic and, you know, is this the right gig for me? I ended up, so the, the, the job that I, 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 um, I got was in, um, a, a healthcare consulting firm agency that, that, uh, mainly worked with pharmaceuticals and, um, essentially do qualitative work for them. Um, doing different forms of research in ethnography, which in the private world, uh, I'm sure, um, <laughs> will, will, you know, the panelists will agree with me. All of us will, will know that that the term ethnography is used very loosely in in uh, in in the private sector. Um, you know, what we think is ethnography is very different than you know what we do ethnography in in in, in healthcare, for example. So, um, I, I loved that. I was enjoying it. I was starting to grow, and I was working towards. Having, um, you know, um, having a, a, a more of a, a senior role in the in in that company, but they decided to shut down the company altogether, <laughs> and I got laid off. 
in uh, in July, uh, which was a blessing in disguise because I I, I landed this job um, in at Evoke Micromass, which is also it's based in North Carolina um, as well. So I, I work remotely, um, and it's uh, essentially we're a, a behavioral strategy um, uh, consulting agency. And again, also with pharmaceutical companies and um, really trying to inform how a patient centric approach to understanding how patients live with particular conditions and why, why um, you know, what they go through in, in their day to day um, uh, with the particular condition and understanding, uh, helping pharmaceuticals understand that so they could, um, you know, um, not just, you know, it's not about just about drugs, right? But it's about how could you have a positive impact on on um, on individual lives and make the quality of life better, especially, you know, um, some projects I've worked on are, you know, um, terminally ill patients. I've worked in different um, spheres, different th therapeutic areas in cardiology, sexual health. Um, um, I've worked also in, in rheumatology and um, optometry. So I've, I've gone, the nice thing about um, sort of, you know, continue to what, you know, building on um, something that Graham had said um, uh, earlier is sort of that you get that little tiny, you're not stuck in your thesis. You're not stuck in that one thing. You're, you're dabbling. You're able to get um, a little bit, you know, of, of each and projects range from anywhere to three years to six months or more, depending on the client. Um, so that was something that interests me. And I, I mean, I, 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 I still like Leith as well. I, um, um, I I, um, I dabble. I, I'm an adjunct on an online university uh, as well. I haven't taught in in a while, but you know, again, having that affiliation because I still love the teaching. I love doing that. Um, and I think what's grateful, um, you know, a, a selfish plug into our wider community. But like, I think one thing that's great about our anthro community in in um, in, in Toronto and general U of T in particular, is that, you know, um, there's a lot of connections. I remember I spoke with Emma, I wrote with, to, to Emma uh, way back when, uh, when I first came, when I was transitioning out and I was trying to figure things out um, and, and you know, getting advice from, from her and getting advice from other colleagues who had, uh, you know, made that transition. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely happy where I am. And to Letha's point, <laughs> you get, you get paid better. Um, and I, I mean, that's, that's the reality. I, I don't like to, you know, it sometimes say, oh, it's not about the money, but you know, in the reality, you know, sometimes it is. And, uh, you know, especially when you, you want to, you want to do what you love, but in a way that you're still being appreciated. And I think that's also something in academia that is, that's difficult, sort of this idea that you are a, um, indentured labor of sorts, right? You're always working towards the next thing like Letha was alluding to earlier, right? Until you die. And then it's like, what have I done? Right. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I, 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 that's where I came into, to all this and how I made that transition, really enjoying it now. Um, I am thinking of publishing, you know, I've, I've now that I've had a, lot, a little bit of distance from my work. Um, I feel I can go back to it, maybe start publishing again, on the side um now that that you know just I've, I've removed myself from that emotional visceral again ethnography being you know that we're very invested in our projects right and and the relationships that we we have with with folks and you know that i i was able to sort of move away from that and um you know still thinking about it um haven't made up my mind uh, my wife is trying to encourage me too because you know she's just uh she was always supporting me throughout the whole the whole time, um, wanting me to like really, you know, succeed and do what you know, enjoy, you know, do what I wanted to do, um, and 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 love it. So, um, so I might I might do that. But anyway, I'll I'll stop there. I don't want to blabble on. I'll uh, I'll I'll hand it back to um, Walt and uh, yeah, excited for the conversation. Very much for that, Joseph. Emma, finally, but not least, <laughs> I'll hand it over to you for. Thank this you. I've got to recap. Thank you. It's great to hear all of your backgrounds. Um, so edifying to hear other people's similar trajectories. So um, I did my PhD at U of T. Um, I completed it. It was twins with my oldest child. Um, they were born in 2008. <laughs> um, they, they came together. I wasn't, my daughter came early. And um, 
I was very organized with my dissertation research. My area of focus was on Jewish diasporic identity with respect to Israel. Um, my, my field work took place during the first Israeli apartheid week at U of T, and U of T actually was my home field site. Um, so I made a lot of friends when I was socializing that research, I can tell you. <laughs> Anyways, um, I... I quickly realized after I had my daughter, I was very lucky. She was a very quiet baby, sleepy baby. And I was able to finish my dissertation six weeks after she was born. And I defended six months after that. Um, but it became very clear that while I, I had thought I had summited Mount Everest when I finished that dissertation. And really, I realized I was just at base camp and there was a lot left to do to be successful on that pathway. And I just didn't have it in me. I had a baby, I had a little family and the thought of having to start like this whole new challenge of trying to secure a position in that job market just wasn't for me. So um, I feel like one thread I'm hearing across all of our experiences is this sense of fortune, fortunate timing. <laughs> um, I think this, so this is 2008 and suddenly um, my skills as a qualitative ethnographic researchers were, researcher were suddenly being sought after outside of academia and industry. And honestly, to everybody's surprise, I was like, I had a marketable set of skills um, to offer the world. I was um, specifically where I was starting to see um, uptick for what I could do was in this new industry called innovation. Um, new because it was just suddenly very trendy. So ethnographic research had been something that marketing firms had been incorporating into their market research toolkits. Um, but um, again, very lucky for me, there was a, at the time, a small boutique consultancy called Idea Couture in Toronto, looking for someone to play the role of resident anthropologist. And I had no idea what that was, but I was happy to pretend to be employed. And um, I had the amazing fortune of actually falling into something I loved. And I didn't think I would love it. Um, but suddenly I was part of a small group of people with radically different skill sets. We were working for Innovation is basically just like problem solving and to come up with better ways to do things for people. Um, human centered is a term that I feel a little bit weird about for a lot of reasons, but that is suddenly the space that I was playing in human centered research and design um, and strategy. So we were working with clients across a broad range of industry verticals, finance, um, business services, pharmaceutical, life sciences, healthcare, consumer packaged goods, banking, like you name it. Um, we were working with our clients to help them better understand the needs, the beliefs, behaviors, and broader context that, um, of the people that they were delivering to. So um, I started with Idea Couture when it was very, very small and um, helped grow the company, scale the company. We took it global. Um, I was there for almost 15 years and I um, grew and led a team of multidisciplinary social scientists, which include anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and other design researchers. Um, and we did that front end research to help drive this human centered strategy um, and experience design work for our clients. Um, we were, um, we were, in, uh, sorry, I'm just going to turn my phone off. Um, what I loved about that work is that it was um, much more collaborative than academia. And so the thing that I told myself about academia that I loved, about being that lone researcher and being in control of what I was doing, it turns out that was just like a story I was telling myself. I loved being part of a team. I loved working with people with radically different skill sets than me that came at problem solving differently. And the other thing I really loved about that work was that um, the way that you distinguish yourself in that setting is by connecting dots 
and and identifying bridges between ideas. Whereas in academia, the way that you distinguish yourself is by identifying gaps in other people's work. And it was very gratifying for me to be a, in a place where success comes from bringing things together as opposed to kind of taking things apart. At least that was my experience of the difference between academia and the way that I was suddenly able to proffer my skill set. Um, in 2017, we were acquired by a large technology company, and um, I had this really weird adventure of um, leading an integration from a smaller consultancy into a massive technology company, and it was an amazing exercise in anthropological translation and trying to understand <laughs> emic and etic and what it meant, and, you know, we realized that we were using all the same words in very different ways. So trying to figure out um, what it would mean to be profitable and go to market together when we actually define profitability differently. It was a very interesting anthropological um, challenge. But after three years, I was able to, we put the business into a really good place in the mothership and I needed to peace out because it became no longer work I really wanted to do. Um, I think an important thing to mention when we're talking about anthropology and doing it outside of academia. So I've been about 15 years at this, maybe more. And I've noticed that where anthropology is being positioned within industry, in my observation, it's moving downstream a little bit. So um, I'm noticing that more and more, and what I noticed in how our organization needed to transform within this broader business, they were looking for um, not as much strategic direction and not as much broad thinking, um, but they were really looking at more tactical use of ethnographic research to drive um, pretty much UX and um, when we talk about it's a digital experience design. And I'm seeing more and more of that. And it's a really, you know, there's a lot of connections and it's a really great segue out of academia is the UX digital experience route. I was feeling bored in that space. So I stepped away from that role in 2020 and um, for the past few years have been splitting my time um, between smaller projects that I do as sort of an independent consultant, working with clients that are much more purpose-driven and working on problems that I think the world really needs to be focusing on, um, rather than clients driven by bottom line concerns. So, um, and, uh, when I'm not doing that work, I'm at the Rotman School of Management, where I am an executive in residence. I teach um, in the MBA program and the executive programs where I bring a design lens into the work that they do They do with executive leadership um, and MBA students. Um, just to give a quick sense of like the kind of work that I think I, that happens um, for me these days, um, I think that there's really interesting spaces to offer these capabilities. So I did a huge, um, a huge research project last year um, with a national not-for-profit to better understand the drivers and barriers um, for youth climate action. And our work was used to develop climate action programs for young people across Canada. Um, I'm doing pretty standard research project right now for Service Ontario to better understand the needs and barriers to service for underserved and vulnerable populations. Um, I also do strategic advisory and consulting. So um, I think where it's really interesting to apply anthropology is not just in ethnographic research, but taking a systems view to broader kinds of transformation. That work is very exciting to me. Um, I just uh, finished a book chapter for a forthcoming Rutledge pub publication on design anthropology. And um, the chapter that we wrote on was on design anthropology and transformative change. So I think there's a lot of really interesting places and spaces you can take anthropology today. Um, my, my watch out would be go into it eyes open and know where you're going. And if UX is for you, that can be a really great way to get out of academia. But, um, you know, there is a landscape out there that's good to be mindful for about. Most excellent. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I'm, I can't help but sit here and remark on each of you have had in some ways very similar trajectories of, of, of why you laugh academia, but how you've also stole a couple of fingers in, in the academic space while, while still doing these transitions into a different kind of work. Um, for, for the general audience, again, feel free to put questions into the into the chat and we will definitely put those to, to our panelists. Or if you're more comfortable speaking, uh, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get to you. Uh, while you're all thinking of questions, I, I'm certain a number of you have some burning questions. Uh, I'd like to, to just pick up on, on, on some of the comments that were made and, and pose a question to, to the panel. Uh, Part of this is actually with, with Joseph, he, he made the, the comment of the external world, the public private sphere has a very different idea of what ethnography is from how, how we experienced it during our, our academic training, right? Connected to that, for, for, for each of the panelists, if, if you've had an experience of, of confusion, <laughs> shall we say, when, when between you and the people you've worked with, the people who've hired you, how you've negotiated that, but also connected to that. Have you have you found it difficult to explain what you bring to the table as an anthropologist in each of your roles? Or did people just accept it, but maybe with that confusion of what it actually was? Whichever one of you wants to start off. I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Um, I think that there is, I'll start with this delta between how we understand what ethnography is and what its outputs are in academia versus what is required of ethnographic style research in industry. And this is something that was like, I had to learn really quickly as soon as we, as soon as we got there. Um, we need to deliver the goal or the job of work in this space is to give our clients a better understanding of the broader context that shape the experience of use of or the experience of service um, for whoever they're delivering to. And it's this broader context that matters. How you get it, it really doesn't matter. So you have to let go of that orthodoxy of what uh, it takes to the, the time and also the way that you write it up. And if we're really calling ourselves um, human-centered practitioners, then we need to be really, really mindful of what our clients need from us to do what they need to do. So over the years, it became it, the way that you write your insights and what is an insight and how you deliver it and what is your story format and how do you shape that? Um, how do you take what you've learned and make it strategic. These are things that really change how you understand the output of your work. And it's just really, really important to um, let go of that formal orthodox understanding of what our work needs to look like. In my opinion, that's been really critical to do work that matters in terms of it having any kind of impact in the world. Um, I think that in the places and spaces that I move through, my stakeholders, whether those are clients or other collaborators, all seem to understand the value that ethnography brings to bear now. Um, it, I think the value proposition is well understood, um, but I think the best way to convey its value is through story around um, how looking at people's experiences in this way have the uh, capacity to shift the understanding of the problem that our clients think that they're solving. So it's um, sharing case studies as a way to say, here's what we were brought in to do. And here's what the client's hypothesis was of where a solution needed to go. We did research in this way and the broader context helped us understand that they're solving the wrong problem. That tends to be a really um, powerful story to shift or sell through what the value of this kind of research is. I often do the difference between a, a wink and a blink. Um, if I you know, need to explain the power of this kind of contextual understanding, um, a lot of times clients think they're solving for a wink, but really it's a blink or vice versa. And only through this kind of storytelling 
do they have enough context to discern the difference? Yeah, I can, uh, I can, uh, yeah, sure. I can, I can uh, chime in as well. Um, just building on what Emma said and everything that I, I agree, I think fully with, with the, the Emma's point on, on storytelling and, and how you package it, I think is, is really important for me from a practical, like my own experience <clears throat> that what was really difficult, especially just coming right out of academia and going into, um, you know, right into it. And um, my, my previous manager was also an anthropologist, had a PhD in anthropology. So, we were able to, you know, that transition was, I guess, a little bit was easy and easier in the sense that she knew my struggle because she had also been in that, you know, that same boat. Um, but something for me that was, was, you know, right off the bat was really um, um, was challenging and I had to do it very quickly, like Emma said too, as well, like you just have to, you have to be on your feet because everything is very fast paced and fast moving was um, just the, the the idea of detail, like I'm very detail oriented, right? And and I love in telling a story, capturing all these, you know, the texture and, you know, um, getting into the nitty gritty. But the nitty gritty can um, can oftentimes, uh, you know, in academia, you don't have to say it, you know, like expand on it in the bajillion ways that we do. All that's good and it's, it has its merit in, 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 you know, in a dissertation. But I had to go from, you know, writing three prayer three paragraphs to three sentences um you know and, and capturing that same idea that essence and trying to play on um the, using that same you know that skill set of storytelling and trying to play with um that 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 again that texture um when, when telling a story um for for particular um you know uh for particular clients so in, in one i remember um for, you know doing um emma mentioned case studies um i've also done um, uh, one thing that I've, I've done as well is like, port, like, um, you take a, a, a patient portrait, um, or a, a doctor portrait. And then based on the research that you get from the, you know, in the different interviews, um, that, that, you know, whether one-on-one -on -one or focus groups or the different kinds of mediums that we use to get, get the information or online ethnography, different, you know, um, different, um, you know, um, tools like using metaphors and um analogies to sort of get get into the deeper meaning of what what somebody's trying to say and then creating a portfolio or a, a persona around that so um again sort of you're doing ethnography but just very differently and again it has that very um creative um there is that creative element to it as um as well um and um in my experience maybe a little bit different than i was at at times i feel that um, maybe now with my current team, uh, so now my my team is a team of behaviorists where it's very multidisciplinary. So again, to Emma's point of like, you know, that collaboration that she was talking about earlier is amazing, right? When you when you realize you could you could, I can somebody with a psychology background, I could really leverage what they're using, and, and it makes sense, you know, for that particular project. Or I'm not sure if you know they want to understand my my experience from you know social cultural uh, understanding of, of of patient experience, how that plays out, sociology. Um, uh, whatever the, the you know the 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 social science discipline is that uh, as part of that team, and the good thing about this the uh, with with micromass that's really great too, is that we're all little teams, um, little by little. I mean, they could be anywhere from like my team is twelve people, um, and other teams you know can have, like on the UX side. So we have UX designers and um, and then behaviorists on on the other side, which we sort of like the two two sides uh, of uh, two sides of the same coin um, and just we, lots of collaboration. And I, I have the benefit of um, having, um, and I, I joke at this because I, I, I'm i laughing at myself of, you know, Girish would, you know, looking at my stuff and be like, what the hell are you writing? This is like, you know, edit properly, man, like get it, get it done. Right. And, and sometimes when you're writing so fast, um, you're, you're, you miss things. So we have copy, a copywriting team that would, um, you know, help me, you know, if, if there's a particular idea I want to articulate, um, I can art, put it down and then we, we craft it together. So again, lots of collaboration and you feel a lot more um, appreciated, I think is, is, is right. Well, your, your work is appreciated for what it is and, and um, um, you're able to, to um, collaborate in a really healthy way um that 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 showcases your skills on one hand and on the other hand uh lets you learn from others as well so um just to build on 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 emma 
there and if, if I hope I answered your question well. Hey, so, please. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll jump in um, with just, uh, you know, a couple kind of thoughts and ideas about maybe the role of ethnography in government, um, if there is such a role. And I'll also, um, I'll address uh, Lily Canel's uh, question about uh, creativity and the affordances of creativity, uh, in my case, in the public service compared to uh, academia. So um, first, I will caveat what I say is that, you know, there's, thousands and thousands and thousands of positions in government and they're all different and everybody kind of says if you don't like the one that you're in it doesn't mean that government isn't a right fit for you it means that you're not on the right team or in the right division so even in my department there's over 10,000 people um, it's massive uh, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing just because of that's just the, the phenomenon of a bureaucracy, right? Um, and it's not because people aren't intelligent or thinking um, or trying to make uh, things work better. But um, I will say that, you know, in my particular role, uh, there is no real room for ethnography in, in the kind of products that I'm uh, coming out with, but it doesn't mean that there isn't room for anthropological thinking. Um, so, um, you know, I would say that I, you know, do kind of an ethnography of government as I'm in it. You know, the first thing you, when you're coming in uh, as an academic is they say, oh, you academics are all jargony and you can't write for a public audience and then, then, and then you find out that, um, you know, government is just a jargoning, it's just a different lexicon. So I've got, uh, you know, a dictionary of um, the words that my colleagues use. Um, and they know that I keep this dictionary and they tease me about it and try to be as obscure as possible when they're talking to me just so that they can get added to the dictionary. So um, in that way, you know, you're once an anthropologist, always an anthropologist. Um, so, um, you know, I'd say there's like a bro more, maybe more of a broader take on social, the, the worth of social science in general uh, and humanities in general. Um, and it isn't, you know, because it's about practical results and it's about creativity, like Emma said, it isn't necessarily, you know, um, labeled in a certain way um, that we might recognize as academics, but it's the same thing that's happening. So, um, you know, in, in there's tons of work going on in the department um, that I think is very much informed by Anthrop anthropological thought or sociological thought, but it's not talked about that way. It's just talked about uh, in terms of outcomes, you know, political outcomes and uh, program outcomes. So um, one thing I do, um, you know, uh, find quite different uh, compared to academia and at least compared to kind of like pure anthropology is as anthropologists, you know, we're really taught to be to think capaciously, to think broadly, uh, to think about the big picture. Uh, and there's certainly room for that in a certain type of policy development. You know, policy kind of goes two ways. Like there's the stuff that comes from the top down that the political masters say, you know, we want to accomplish X. And then there's the stuff, stuff that happens kind of in the analyst level of saying, you know, we're seeing a, a particular issue or problem. We have ideas and you're trying to push it up the train and get somebody to pay attention to it, right? So that's a bit harder to do um, because um, you know you're competing against other ideas um, uh, and that way you can kind of think more broadly and big picture um, but if you're being asked to um, you know produce something in a in a short timeline you stay in your lane so for example uh, one, you know, kind of a, one of a, the day-to-day -day parts of my job is that I'll get um, certain UN re resolutions that come across my desk. Um, so, for example, uh, the Human Rights Committee is, is sitting uh, right now. So um, I will get um, an email from, uh, you know, my colleagues at Global Affairs and they'll say, can you please read this resolution and tell us, are there any red lines on protection language based on Government of Canada policy? So I'm not going through that resolution like I would, um, you know, at somebody's dissertation chapter and say, well, have you, can you rethink the way that you're thinking about gender here or your assumptions about, you know, African childhood or like blah, 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 blah. No, 
I'm saying, you know, did you say, did you use the words forced migration versus forced displacement? Uh, what did you say about climate? What did you say about this? And does it align with what has happened before? So in that way, you know, we're not looking for new and innovative ideas. Um, you know, when I, I first made the mistake when I came in of like, you know, trying to write something uh, in a new way. And no, actually, you are asked to copy and paste because there needs to be a consistent messaging between departments, between teams. Um, and you are not going to be congratulated for saying something new and beautiful. Um, you're going to say, they're going to say, well, this wasn't, this is not approved language, go and change it. So, um, so in that ways, there's, you know, kind of some tension, I suppose, between like that anthropological, uh, uh, you know, instinct. But I will say when it comes to um, Lily Kennell's question about creativity, um, uh, in a lot of ways, I feel I have um, much more room for it than I did in academia for sheer reason of space and time. So I'm uh, the type of person who cannot really come up with new ideas if I feel like I'm overloaded with other tasks. So I, I found, you know, because I did, I didn't do a postdoc. I went straight from the ten, you know, from grad school to the tenure track. Um, was at a university without, um, you know, sabbaticals or any at any of those things, uh, and it was just hitting the ground running. You know, you're teaching, you're going to conferences, you're doing this and this and this, uh, and you're so overloaded that for me it didn't open up any kind of mental space to have like ideas crop up or new ideas. And I felt like kind of creatively dead uh, because of that um, and, you know, very burnt out. But I find now that I have a better balance that there's a little bit more space to explore and think both within the job and also without it, you know, that now I'm like, you know, when it's 5 p.m. or it's the weekend, I'm not so tired that I can't imagine doing other things or having hobbies, even if that means like, you know, writing anthropology stuff. Um, so uh, in that way, um, I find it's been much, much healthier for, for my creative spirit um, in general. I love those summaries. I just want to say, I, I was nodding and laughing at different times because I've had some, some very similar experiences to all three of you. Uh, in, in, in some of the consulting work that I do as well, uh, where you've got the freedom, but then you've got, you're told, no, oh, this is what we're asked for, stop going outside of these lines. So I, I love that we we all have had something similar in that, and that, that we've, we've got that experience coming from. I'm seeing questions in the chat, but I'm also seeing hands. Uh, Emma, I'm thinking you're wanting to respond to something, and then we'll get to Yvonne. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll handle the questions in the chat. I wanted to quickly like just offer a little bit more dimension around how creativity shows up um, outside of academia and my experience in the work. Um, and I think we spoke about one of them is that the problems that you're solving turn over really quickly, right? So you go from topic area to topic area a lot. So there's a certain amount of just creative energy that comes into consulting in a new subject area that you have to get smart pretty quickly and you have to be creative in terms of how you translate what you know into something that's relevant in that domain. So that's one piece, but I think more substantively is in the, it's a constant um, challenge to figure out how to tell stories about other people's stories in a way that resonates. And at least in the places where I've offered my services, the um, it's, a, it's an ongoing evolution of style in terms of storytelling. So, so creative in terms of like, how am I going to, how am I going to structure this report? It, it's never just in my, in my experience, I'm not working in, in a government or in a highly regulated space where the output of my work needs to be quite codified. So I get to figure out what are the different ways that I can pull together voices, but then situate them within a broader strategic narrative that will really help um, deliver the impact of it. And that to me is like a wonderfully creative exercise. Um, the other thing is in terms of blending, there's a very creative experience of up 
bringing your ethnographic sensibilities or anthropological sensibilities um, to collaborate with other um, domains. So if I'm working with a psychologist or if I'm working with an engineer, I love working with engineers. Honestly, collaborating with engineers forces me so far out of my comfort zone. It's such a creative um, way to think about how to make what I know to be, what I think to be true, meaningful for them and in a way for us to bring our stuff together to be meaningful to our client is wonderful, actually. So um, playing around with new methodologies, I do a lot of strategic foresight now and I blend it with my ethnography and coming out with new kinds of deliverable formats um, that allow the outputs of different methods to be showcased together in an impactful way, also a very, very creative um, set of exercises. So I just wanted to add some detail around that. Perfect, perfect on that. Uh, Yvonne, we will get to you in one second. Uh, I, I feel like I've been keeping Lily and Awa, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, both of whom had very similar questions, which, which both Lisa and Emma have, have touched on, but I think just to really make sure that we, we get to their question. Uh, so Lily asked, uh, I wonder if you miss the creative affordances of academia. If you sometimes find yourself caught up in daily tasks and a result or in its modality and lacking the time or space to be creative. And Awa asked very similarly, uh, well, I mean, her question is slightly similar to Lily's. How do you adjust in a work environment where one does not have the same freedom or opportunity to be flexible in your routine? something that does not become redundant corporate would be from being in academia to going into a nine to five. And I would, I would add into that also, and I, this was sort of touched on by both Lisa and Emma as well, uh, this notion of academic freedom. That, 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 and I, I know I experienced this with some of the consulting work that I do as well, where it's like, yes, we're, we're kind of left on our own. <laughs> and if we end up in a research university as well, do we have that same ability? Yeah, this is such a great question. And it's something that, you know, I'm still coming to terms with, you know, like I, I certainly have days where I just wish I could have a nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, that's probably just who I am as a person. But I would say, generally speaking, uh, I think it a, a lot of it has to do with personal preference preference uh, in kind of the way you want to organize your work life. However, I will say that I think the kind of the flexibility of routine in academic positions, I also think are kind of a trap. I think it's kind of illusory. I don't have you know, I didn't have my department chair ever asking me at 9am, are you in front of your desk? Um, you know, uh, she didn't care. She's busy doing her own thing. But the fact is, is that I was, I was at my desk from like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And, uh, you know, yes, I, you know, I might go to the gym or, you know, do something else in, in the meantime. But uh, it also meant that, you know, when classes are over, um, you know, at the end of the semester, I'm expected to be doing research or doing writing and, you know, try to manage my own time, maybe have a break in there at the same time. And what that meant is that for me personally, I just felt like I was always on and there was never any kind of clear boundary. And that really weighed on me psychologically. So I, um, because I uh, work in Vancouver, my job is located in Ottawa, you may have heard that public servants have been called back to the office. That's a bit complicated for IRCC because IRCC um, more than doubled during the pandemic. Um, so they don't physically actually have spaces for all of us and I've uh, managed to not be called to Ottawa. Um, but um, because I work a lot with UNHCR, I'm often having meetings with people in Geneva or people in Ottawa. Uh, and it means that, you know, I might have to start work at five or six in the morning, but it means that I'm off at one or two. Um, and it's, it's very defined. Uh, and I find that really actually quite liberating that I know I'm gonna take a break. And you know, I don't have a micromanager. If, if I go need to go do something, it's fine. You know, somebody can text me if, I, if I'm missing something. Um, but generally speaking, I find it, you know, uh, that all in all, even though it looks on paper, like 
I, I'm more of a drone, I actually find that I have so much more freedom because I know at 4 p.m. it's my time. I can't even check my email on my personal phone if I wanted to because of because of security reasons. Um, so like I actually have to be logged in sitting at my work computer, otherwise nothing's happening. So um so yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. It's like sometimes I, you know, yeah, I want to be able to just like go off and take a week in the summer and do whatever I want. And I don't necessarily have like that leave time, but uh, I think ultimately it's probably a better situation for me. I would just echo, um, I would echo everything that Letha has said, but also in my situation and in the roles that I've been um, fortunate to occupy, I've actually had a ton of autonomy in my roles. Um, and I, I love the break between my, my, my job and my life. That's been like, I totally get that psychological freedom that you get from that rather than that, these ongoing perpetual things that you're working on, that it's really hard to separate yourself from that, that space has been very beneficial for my mental health for sure. Um, but also, it also just depends on the particular organizational culture of wherever you land. I mean, I've been so lucky. I, I've never had a work situation where anyone has cared, like even pre-COVID, no one cared where I worked from. Like I had a team and I had to go be with them a lot, but like I have worked from home a lot too. And no one ever cared if I had an appointment in the middle of the day and everyone went to the gym in the middle of the day. And like, it was just, I think that um, if you're considering a career outside of academia and you want to be one of the things that you consider as a job seeker is the organizational culture that you're looking for in a role. And I think um, if that's something that's important to you, autonomy was super important to me. That's something I don't look at a lot of job roles that look to me like they are more structured and rigid and would require me to sort of be anywhere at any specific time you know and that's just me and i think that you can be mindful about that in your job searching yeah and i i can add to that as well i think for me um leaf is going to laugh at, at this when i say this because um you know i i was known i mean this is a confession public confession um i'd be in the office you know, I, I, what was our office? AP 420, was it? Four, it was yeah, It was 420, yeah. 420, right? I, I still remember. That's right. Um, so I had the corner, I had the corner office, like the owner, like this little corner part. And I mean, I would go, I, I, I sort of told myself, I'm going to make my nine to five, uh, like my, my wife's work time, she worked downtown as well. We're going to commute together and I'm, I'm not going to work from home. I'm going to end up, you know, going to the office and I'm going to work there. So I'd show up, you know, I'd, I'd be there early, bright and early. I'm, I'm going to start writing. And then I'd take a nap on my desk and Letha would walk in, find me sleeping on my desk. You know, and then, you this know. man fell asleep on a speedboat while it was moving. He can sleep anywhere. <laughs> that, that, that's true, too. Uh, I, I, I have I, I, I like to think of it as a gift. Um, definitely. So it's uh, I can I can sleep anywhere. So definitely I'm going to take advantage of sleeping literally on my desk, like just put my head down. I'd be out for like. I don't know, 30, 40 minutes and then wake up. I'm going to be fresh. I'm going to be ready to, you know, work. And then I end up, you know, I, you know, I didn't need to think and I need to walk. So, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's, I'm, I'm, I'm making, you know, I'm, I'm pointing, you know, I'm making fun of myself, but at the same time making a point, like I'm, I'm a creature who needs structure. Um, I need that nine to five and it's actually more freeing because, um, you know, I have to clock in a 40 hour work week, for example. Um, so that's, it works out to eight hours a day. Um, but, um, you know, nobody's micromanaging me and, you know, there's that flexibility and that, that autonomy to, you know, if I work six hours one day, I can work, you know, uh, I can make up for those two hours that I missed on one day. Another time, if I, you know, need to take my son to an appointment or, you know, pick him up from daycare, whatever that might be, um, you know, there's, there's that flexibility and, 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 and feeling that freedom. And I, I, you know, touching on, 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 on Letha's point of like, you know, in academia, you're sort of, you're always on right? Even, even when, you know, in my experience, when I'd finish writing, you're always thinking about it. I'd wake up at, you know, I still do this, but you know, at work, you know, you have that aha idea three o'clock in the morning, you know, it, it, that, you know, that's your, your mind is always working like that. So what, what I found is that with that flexibility of nine to five is like five o'clock comes 
I shut off and it's like my own, you know, I can actually like relax, spend time with my family, enjoy my son for the couple hours that he's back from daycare before we put him down for bed, you know, and um, it gives me that creative license again to, 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 to you know, to, to be, you know, when you have more rest, you have more ability to think freely, I think. Um, at least in 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 my 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 experience and echoing, I guess what also what Emma and, and Alitha said on that. So um, you know, nine to five isn't necessarily a bad thing. And it, you know, I that having less structure can also be damaging, as it was not because not my naps, like not because of my naps, but like in the sense that it's like I have more time or I, I can think about then. I would make excuses for myself and I, I wouldn't, I'm being very honest. Like I, I think we've all probably experienced this, but I'm, I'm being very honest and I want to be transparent as well. Like, you know, in my experience of how, you know, that transition was also difficult of having that free time and, you know, not able to do things that I want to um, as much, you know, um, I can't take a two hour nap <laughs> in the middle of the day, but you know, um, that kind of thing where, you know, there is that flexibility still, even within that structure. Um, I have and, to say, it is really nice to know that if I have a weekend, I know that I can make weekend plans no matter what, or I can go away because right. I'm not like wondering, uh, do I have essays to mark or exams to grade or do I need to prepare for, you know, a lecture coming up on Monday? It's like, no, I can, I can like do things that other people do like a real human being. Okay. Uh, Yvonne, thank you for so patiently waiting. Uh, you can Turn your camera on or leave it off, your choice. <laughs> and Thank you. Thanks. I would like to turn my camera on, but my $300 laptop that I bought for grad school, the video stopped working. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, so anyways, this has been like really inspiring and encouraging and like some of the things that you're talking about, like just the struggles and that you had in academia, just feeling like tired or always having to prove yourself, like that really rings true in my experience. Um, However, I'm still at the beginning of it. I just completed my candidacy in January and I'm at the beginning of my field work. Um, but I've never really anticipated or wanted to have um, a career in academia. And so I know, I know you all kind of fell into your jobs um, after and it didn't seem like, it doesn't sound like you were planning to work outside of academia. I mean, some of you were planning to go into academia, but you fell out of it but if you had known that you wanted a job outside of academia, like what would you have done in your field work to get these amazing jobs that you have now? And so I guess I'm wondering like what strategies or suggestions do you have? Because there's some things I could be doing now in my field work or what I'm doing to help um, get a job such as the ones you have. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a really um, good question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Joe, you Okay, so um, yeah, great question. Uh, really important question. And I would say that, um, you know, also full disclosure is I didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily gunning for an academic position. I mean, it sounds kind of disgusting to say this given how hard people uh, try to get positions, but it just kind of happened. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, um, but the thing that I really struggled with um, is that I don't really know what people do all day outside of academia. And, you know, when people say, well, like what, what would be your dream job? I mean, we can all say, well, I don't dream of labor, right? Um, but like, I don't actually know what people do. So I can't tell you what it is. Um, I, you know, I put a link in the chat um, to this uh, book that I found really useful. It came out just as I was like, um, you know, making the decision to quit um, and it's called uh, Leaving Academia. And the thing that I really love about this book is that I I was not interested in, in reading Quitlet. Like I find like that's become like such a genre that it, it has almost become kind of like a gross industry in itself. Um, and I like, I didn't need to read more about other people's trauma um, to know that, you know, something wasn't working. Um, or to hear somebody complain about that the, the job market is broken. Like, I just didn't find that personally useful anymore. Um, but the thing that I really like about this book is that it's totally practical. Every single chapter um, has like an action plan after it of things that you can do of how you find out what people do all day. 
how to find those people, how to reach out, how do you take your skills as an academic? And this was something that was kind of geared towards people in the social science and humanities, which I really appreciated because, you know, these books can really, really differ based on your discipline, but I found them useful as an anthropologist um, that you can say like, how is it that managing a classroom full of people or creating a syllabus uh, can actually translate into all of these other things and and they tell you like word for word how to do it um and i found that like e extremely helpful um when it comes to like setting yourself up now i would say it's try to try to diversify your experiences even if they're volunteer experiences i know uh obviously it's much, much better to be compensated for your labor. I'm not, I'm not suggesting um, that you, you starve yourself, certainly not in this economy, uh, uh, if, if you can avoid it. Um, but even if it's just like a part-time thing, um, uh, you know, something that was really kind of interesting and surprising to me coming into the government job and the program I got is that some of the experiences I had that there were the most important, um, were really the things that were like marginal to my academic career. It was like the stuff I kind of did on the side um, in like working with NGOs or, um, you know, doing kind of like um, mini consultancies or um, kind of practical things on the side prior or during to my field work, um, or even just like organizational planning that was like the stuff that actually strengthened my resume. Uh, nobody cares about my latest publication. They just don't. They're like, wow, she's got her PhD. That's great. Um, you know, that 10 page CV you have, um, you're going to delete eight pages of it. Um, and then they're going to still say it's too long, right? They're going to say, what are your skills? What can you do? Um, and I think that's also the strength of, you know, somebody who's come out of a grad program is that they're a professional learner right, is that I could show that even if I'm not an expert in whatever issue, I, I can think on my feet and I can learn really quickly. Um, and uh, that has, has everything to do with being able to explain how your, your skills translate. Um, so I do really uh, recommend that book. Um, so I don't, I know that's not particularly helpful if you're saying like, how do I actually find an experience? Um, but um, at least from the, the perspective of government, um, you know, look into as many like bridging opportunities or even student experiences, even if you just get like a, you know, a three month, um, uh, you know, position or whatever, uh, just even understanding how government works on the inside is going to put you really, really far ahead if that's something that you want to aim for in the long term. It's going to jump in to, 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 to reinforce some of what Lisa just said, because a lot of consulting I do is also with, with government. And a lot of government agencies and the think tanks that they've created and fund, a lot of them now actually have youth advisory boards set up. So that may be something, if, depending on which particular field you're interested in, that may be something to, to really explore to get your foot in the door as well with those different agencies. It, it's it's and yeah, the 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 I, the, the, the word that Lisa talked about, absolutely one of the one of the tools. But when you're much more junior, um, yeah, the, the, the youth advisory boards. I three of the think tanks that I sit on, we have those, and they're they're a great tool. One to keep us older people a little more sharp in current thinking and current issues, but also to to actually have to develop those skills. Uh, Emma or Joseph, do you have anything more to? that you'd like to add to, uh, to Yvonne's I, question. I would quickly, um, in addition to everything that, that Letha said, uh, I think just looking for any small consulting opportunities to pad that resume with, um, any kind of opportunities, and I don't know what your field work is, and I don't know what the ethical considerations are for you in terms of engaging um, you know, with folks in your in your field research, but, um, you know, looking for any kind of small research gigs that you can use to show your consulting portfolio is really, really helpful. Um, and I think on the sort of softer side, um, practicing your stakeholder engagement skills in a really sort of strategic way. I mean, one of the things that I think academics have, um, 
a little bit of a harder time with when they need to transition out of academia into industry contexts is stakeholder management. Um, so being able to have really confident conversations with people um, where you're able to confidently translate what you bring to the table into a way that resonates for what they need. Um, just using your opportunities, if you think of your field research as a period of time where you get to practice stakeholder engagement and just think about, um, are there ways that you might offer workshops or facilitations within your field work? Does that make sense for what you're studying? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but um, being able to demonstrate um, experience in engaging with folks in that way can be valuable, can be valuable just to take what you're doing and just sort of position it and package it up in terms of the things that you might be hired to do outside of academia. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I can add to to Emma and, and Letha just briefly um, in terms of diversifying. So um, I think Emma's point on uh, finding consulting, I think that's what really helped me as well in my resumes, having that, you know, uh, um, uh, a consulting gig um, that gave me that experience to show that I can work in industry. Um, although they knew that I was predominantly coming out of an academic background, but that still helped, you know, to get my foot in the door. And then for my second job, um, it was much quicker. Uh, again, that, so that's another thing to to think about too practically. Once you get your foot in the door, it's much easier to move around than it is that first job is is um, you know is is difficult. Um, but having having like some of that experience that that Emma said, I think definitely helped me um, get my foot in the door for sure. Um, you know, also diversifying your methods um, in, in the type of thing. So along with stakeholder management. Um, or thinking of how you can apply that to stakeholder um, holder management, as as, as uh, Emma was mentioning, di diversify your methodologies. So at least in, in in my work, there's different kinds of methodologies that we use um, with different you know different co pharma companies and sort of different things that you like to use. So for example, focus groups uh, versus one on one interviews uh, versus descriptive writing, right? So di like you know, um, diversify these different things. And I would even say, you know, try and use different um, techniques like um, metaphors and analogies that, that you can find on online. Uh, I can try and find something quickly, but, you know, like, um, you know, asking respondents or interlocutors um, if they were to um, describe, um, you know, um, um, their experience in a, as a particular animal, for example, what's that animal and why is it, um, it why, why do you choose that animal? Right. I, I mean, I'm using it for, I'm, I'm, because I'm in the health, we use a lot of that, these metaphors and stuff in, in the healthcare space, but um, you know, uh, I think it's, it's important, you know, if, if you do that, you're, you're able to sort of practice um, of course, where it is and if it's appropriate to do so, obviously, let me, <laughs> if, if, if you're, you know, if you're not going to ask, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect Lisa to ask that kind of question somewhere. You, you know, that that's I think being sensitive, being se sensitive as well. Like, so I, I, I want to, um, you know, make that clear. Just again, diversifying methodology and trying to think of different ways that you could use it. Um, and um, something that you, you know, a lot of positions that I apply for, actually, all the positions that I apply for when I when I, I did leave there, they they're hiring uh, graduate students, so they want MEs and PhDs. So you're already desired for so that's another something to, th to think about that um i think you, um as uh, academics we're very much if you if you have a phd you have an ma um in anthropology you're very much re you're respected like there's there's positions for you that that are, are geared towards that they want specifically ma or phd students um and in my case at least um it, from from what i'm under like what i understand in in uh in in um in my work that also you know my particular title is because of my experience working in industry but also having the phd versus somebody who just has an ma you know that that gives again leverage in terms of um promotions and thinking about again from a practical perspective once you you get your foot in the door um but yeah that's uh, that's all i i wanted to to add to that i was going to ask if there were any more questions i think i see glenn has one 
Hi folks, my name is Glenn. I'm the admin and communications assistant now for the Department of Anthropology, which I'm sure everyone here on the panel has interacted with a little bit. And I'll probably be contacting you all just to try and share some of this great information that's uh, been shared through this event, uh, through something, through the department. And yeah, I guess I was wondering if you think it's a good idea, if you would encourage people to uh, pursue a master's degree or a PhD in anthropology, knowing what you know now, um, and uh, why or why not, potentially, I, I know that there are a lot of folks who are already sort of in, in the pipeline now, but I think I'm also, uh, you know, speaking with a lot of undergraduate students who may be trying to figure it out. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to ask that question. I, I can jump in. Um... I think that I I am so I feel so privileged to have been able to do the amount of graduate work that I did. I mean, my my driver was always just I want to stay in school. I don't want to work yet. I want to stay in school. I don't really want to work yet. I like school. School's easy. I keep getting funding. I want to stay in school. And I think that it's a very 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 privileged position to be in where you get to study what you want like it's so free like you get to study what you want you're getting paid and subsidized to do so and um i think that if someone has the capacity to be part to to do that in your life without having to worry about generating a lot of income i think it is a wonderful way to spend your time honestly it is an amazing way to spend your time and i find that it has been a really, it's given me a competitive competitive advantage in the workplace. And I think not necessarily as an anthrop anthrop anthropologist, but as just the arts. I think the arts are a really interesting way to differentiate yourself in any in kind of professional context. If you can pull on examples from history or mythology or literature, any kinds of to make sense of a situation and offer people those mm -hmm. kinds of frameworks to look to incorporate into whatever kind of problem you're solving. I think it is such a wonderful toolkit to bring into like any scenario that requires collaborative problem solving, honestly. But I also know that it can be really expensive. And if you're not generating savings when you're doing it. So short answer, if you can afford to do it, it is, from my experience, it was just like such a wonderfully self-indulgent thing to be able to participate in. And um, my research had an impact and it had to do with things outside of myself, obviously, but it was, I was driving my interests in like in a very individual way. Um, if you're able to take the time to do it, I think it can be extremely important from a differentiation perspective. Yeah, I'll just jump in and echo uh, what Emma said. I, I really agree with her. Um, I also feel incredibly privileged to have had the opportunity to get the PhD. I would say um, from, a, from a purely practical standpoint uh, where I am in government, uh, the PhD is not needed. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'd say an MAS um, or an MSc. Um, and that isn't to say that my experience and all the experience that I gained uh, during the PhD isn't really important and essential. Um, but when it comes to just like the pure designation, um, you know, anything beyond an, a, an MA um, is generally speaking, unless you are like an actual government scientist, it's not an advantage over anything else. Um, it's going to be much, much more about uh, work experience. Um, and so, um, like Emma, I would say, personally, I feel like unless you're going into academia, the primary motivation has really has has to be like your own personal interests. And if you, if you really, really, you know, want to put yourself out there. So that, you know, I would say generally, like the work I do in government versus academia is the academic work is is ego driven, right? It's like, you know, as much as we like to talk about our interlocutors, like, you know, it's Letha Victor's name on that dissertation, on that book. Um, and when I'm writing in government, I'm writing for the government of Canada. I am, it's self-effacing and it has to be. Um, and in that way, um, you also do not have to shoulder all of the responsibility that you do 
um, as a PhD candidate or student uh, when it comes to kind of you know, stakeholder relations, I suppose we could say. Um, but um, anyways, uh, that's tangential, but I will just, yeah, say that uh, do it, be, do it, you do it for you. The PhD is for you. It's not for your career um, unless you want to be a professor. Yeah, and, and um, I, I've, I've shared that advice with, uh, so I guess, Glenn, to your point, um, by the way, I, I miss, uh, I'm looking at Harvard Street behind you, which is, or uh, that is Harvard, right? And it's no longer it's uh it's no longer Russell Street, but I I I uh, I uh, I'm very nostalgic. I got very nostalgic all of a sudden. So thanks for that. <laughs> but um, you know, advice that I've shared with with um with with undergrads before, and I said um, you know, this is a long time. Think of it as a long time, a long term relationship. Don't do it like you know you're investing your time, your effort. It's a, it's a, there's there's going to be ups and lows and and all these things. So um like for me i think for for ma students who are thinking of phd just you know going to the phd stream again you're doing it to Letha's point you're doing it for you um and um, for for your you know because you want to do it um but if you know evaluating and sort of discerning whether or not it's the right decision um just recognizing that um that long term commitment pays off uh, of course, and, and and definitely you could use it. Um, I mean, different things like Lisa said in 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 um, in, um, in her work. You don't you know you might not necessarily need a PhD. Um, in mine, maybe it's a little bit different, right? In, in healthcare, it's 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 a little bit different than that, um, and they value that, which is which is great. But you know, I, I I'm now like I'm in healthcare. I had nothing, you know, I. Um, uh, you know, I was in the desert, I was in the Egyptian desert, <laughs> you know, for, for five months and, you know, in the California desert for, for another eight. So it's, it's, you know, your skills, what I'm trying to say is your skills will translate um, and thinking of that, of how you could, what you've gained, what you're going to learn throughout the PhD or master's or PhD will translate into you being able to use it in, in different aspects um, because that's the desirable, you know, your um, those are things your, your, your skill set is desirable to Emma's earlier point in the conversation, right? You're, there is a desire for um, that that work ethic, that 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 um, you know, bringing that 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 research your research skills to the table. I think is important to think about. And I see we have a, another hand, Mariana. We do. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for this. Hello. <laughs> um, I missed the first bit, so I'm sorry if this has already been discussed. Um, and I know that uh, for the panelists, they're sort of their own stories of how they moved through academia and then got jobs outside are all different. Um, but, and maybe this speaks to the specific phase I'm in right now. I'm in my eighth year. I'm like trying to finish, don't know what's going on. But I think a lot of the conversations that I'm noticing happening amongst my peers is the sense that oh I'm not going to go into academia because I like can't cut it like it's not you know I a lot of it's coming from a place of like a fear or a sense of failure or a sadness about like the lack of jobs whatever it is um and so in a way there's still this I don't know it it seems like it's hard to actually talk about the path towards a non-academic job while being in academia because um, the expectation is that you're going to do a postdoc and become a professor. So I'm just curious about like if there are any thoughts or advice, even of how to have the conversation like with your advisors. They're expecting it. They're like, so when are you applying for postdocs? And not even asking like, what do you want to do? So how do we like normalize? I guess being able to have these conversations that aren't just through the lens of like, oh, I'm leaving because I can't. I'm not going to make it in academia or something like that. Anyway, thank you. I mean, I I I, I wish Girish was here uh, to speak to that. So Girish was one of my supervisors. Um, I um, so I was actually I had it's interesting with your question, uh, Marianne. I think it's uh, it's, it's an important one. Like for me, I think I was actually worried. I'm being very, again. I told you guys from the I was going to be very honest. I was actually worried of what Girish would think of me, uh, of abandoning academia, right? Like investing all that time working with me, um, you know, and and getting my 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 um you know getting me ready for for defending and, and all that and i was you know 
I was worried. Um, and you know, as 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 um, you know, Girish on one hand is my supervisor, then other mentors in the, in the department as well, what they would think. But Mr. President was very supportive, right? I had the conversation like, look, this is what I'm thinking. Um, you know, I'm I'm still I was still dancing around whether I was going to stay or not. Um, and um, if I wanted to keep pursuing, and I had mentioned this earlier, Mariana, I guess in, in in the area, like for me, I was I was just in a place in life where I had I I couldn't I had to make a decision, um, and I couldn't you know wait to to see what kind of postdoc that you know. I, yes, I got kept getting rejected, and that's disheartening. But I also had to be I was I was at a position where I had to make a decision because you know it it just it wasn't viable uh, for my family um, situation. Um, so I, I um, that's that, that that was from my end. But you know, uh, having that conversation, I think, you know, with Girish, I remember, you know, being very open and being very honest about, you know, um, his advice of if you know if if I should continue or not. Um, and I remember, I recall, you know. Um, it's sort of gearing to me sort of setting it up it's like I, I can't do this anymore and sort of gear supporting me towards that um that decision um and, and making it so I guess you know if, if you have that kind of relationship with your supervisor that's always very good um I'm fortunate to have had a good um you know relationship with him um and, and still do for that matter um you know and you know being able to talk openly about that and you know I I, I early on I went I went through an identity crisis still I'm like who am I, right? Like, am I an academic? Am I in the private sector, right? You, these things are, you're, you're, these are things that you wrestle with. Um, and I think it's really discerning and, and stepping back and like asking yourself again to maybe linking it to the, the previous question. What's best for me? Forget about what other, other people are going to think. What do I need, right? And, you know, Letha and I had lots of conversations when she was transitioning out of academia into that and you know um letha can speak for herself i'm not gonna but uh, like you know just being part of that conversation you know um i remember telling letha like that you know I i'm so proud of you for doing what you, you know you need to do what you need to do right um and it, you you have to evaluate what it comes down to your mental health and who you are as a person um and whether or not this is something that you know are, are are you you know and i i speak for myself you know put you you know you put on this facade uh, of like you know I, i'm that professor you know um i'm joey the professor you know that kind of thing or you know i'm, I'm you know that you I, I was starting to become something i didn't want to be not that there's anything wrong with being a professor obviously but for the wrong reasons, right? I, again, it was from that prestige of that 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 ego speaking. So I, I you know, I, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to support my, you know, be, you know, have have a viable income that 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 worked, and um, I wanted to make an impact. Also, with my degree, like as an anthropologist, we, you know, we want to make imp have an impact in the world. So I felt that, you know, when I had that opportunity to transition to healthcare, that's where it became very evident to me, although there was still that identity crisis going on a little bit, but it became very clear to me, I can still be very impactful as an anthropologist with my degree. Even if I'm not an academic, I don't have to be writing, I could be actually, you know, in, in, you know, I'm impacting the ways in which companies talk about themselves, right, or the ways in which they're able to relate to patients, all these kind of things. So um, I blabbled on much longer than I wanted to, sorry, I tend to do that. But yeah. <laughs> um. I, I really appreciated hearing that. Um, I don't think you blabbed for too long. I think that um, to answer, I think in your in your question is what normalizes that decision. Um, I think interactions like this one right here are really important to normalize um, the fact that there are so many different pathways. And I think that academia, even though, you know, listen, it's been a while since I was in this department, but, you know, I was such a good little Marxist and I, I was like had the very um, well-defined ideological frameworks that um, really like set what I thought was good and right. And it was very, very narrow. Um, it is a very big wide world. And 
within academia, there is a, in my experience, only mine, it was a very, very narrow definition of what good looks like, right? Um, and that I felt was kind of complicated by the fact that at least in my experience, this discipline doesn't offer very much support from a career pathing perspective. I have a sister-in-law who um, is a political scientist and she did her degree in the US and like she was on a freaking conveyor belt in terms of job market. Like the steps and stage gates and support and levers that her um, her supervisors pulled for her, like the job acquisition process for her looked very different for me. And I this I am not casting shade on anyone in this department. It was just, I think in anthropology, it's just like a very different culture and vibe around how you go about getting your 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 job offers. And um I just and I had the experience of I was like a super keen grad student. I was like on all the committees and I was on a job. I was on I, I think one of the big things that turned my um, opened my eyes to the fact that like maybe a, a academic career may not be the right path. I was probably like six or seven months pregnant. So like sidebar, I don't think my, my supervisors who were all dudes, like, I think they were just like, get it done, have your baby. Don't worry about anything else. So I wasn't getting a lot of pushing um, for that, but I was on, uh, I was a grad student rep on a hiring committee for the, for our department. And I had this crazy moment in a meeting where there are all these like printed out academic CVs in front of us. And we had like looked through all of them and we were literally doing yes pile, no pile. And I couldn't believe who was going into the no pile. Like I couldn't believe the accomplishments and the impressiveness of the people that were like, nope, 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 nope. And it was just like, oh, this is like not something that's for everyone. And it's a choice sort of, you know, um, what Joey said, what Letha said, like, it's a choice. We all have a choice what we want to be when I grow up. I'm still changing my mind. Like, you know, I'm 47 and I'm like entering a whole different season of my career because I just felt like it. And I think that like, you can make those decisions yourself and you don't owe anybody anything in the department or in the field it's really up to you and what works for you. And I just think these conversations and creating opportunities for them to happen in an, in a department like this one at U of T are so important. Um, yeah, I think it's great that you showed up and come to more of them if they're offered. Yeah, um, thanks. I, you know, I totally agree with what Emma and Joey have said um, that, having conversations like this is really important. Um, I will say, you know, U of T anthropology is also an especially kind of high theory, highfalutin type place. And, you know, I don't, you know, I was always frustrated as a grad student that there wasn't more like kind of career direction for other opportunities. But at the same time, I didn't blame those people because those are, you know, these professors are the people who, who got onto that path. So like, why would they know differently? Right. Uh, I will say, yeah, the political scientists have it in the bag. I, you know, so many of my colleagues are political scientists. It's just really disgusting. Um, but um, I will say, you know, to Mariana's question about like, there's a lot of shame about it. And a lot of that shame has to do with like the internal culture of academia and the internal culture of anthropology in particular, um, because we have been told and uh, internalized the idea that this is our vocation. It is who we are. It is not just something that we do. And I, uh, you know, that is, a, it's a really important way of moving through your, your life of having a sense of purpose, but it can also make it really dangerous for you and really scary when it's not working for you. So, um, you know, the hardest part for me leaving academia and Joey knows this from our many conversations was like the shame and the embarrassment of, um, 
you know, being in this program where everybody says you're not going to get a job because there's no jobs, there's no jobs, there's no jobs. I, you know, I land that, that one job. Um, and I remember somebody coming up to me and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to take the job. I, I didn't want to really live in the States. And somebody came up to me and said, you know, if you don't take this job, you're crazy and we're all looking. And, and, you know, I, that really impacted me. And, it, and it, he, he had vocalized something that was, that was really like, it was in the air, right? Um, and, you know, telling my colleagues that I was leaving was so hard. And the person who it was hardest to tell was not my department chair, was not my dean, was not my students. It was my PhD supervisor, right? Um, who still periodically harasses me and wants to know when my book is going to be finished, which is sweet though. It's because he like has encouraged me and cares about me and believed in me. Like it wasn't from a place of, you know, uh, you know, anybody saying you must do this. Um, but, you know, it took a really long time for me to realize that like, I have to be in the driver's seat of my own life. I have to. I can't just do this because I'm good at it or just because I can. I refuse to be shot at at work. I refuse to work on a militarized campus. Um, I refuse to like have the living conditions that I had um, and to be told that it's normal to not live with your family or it's normal to have to move countries or all these things it, just in order to have like a fairly shitty salary um, in uh, like the Applebee's of America. So, um, you know, not to get too personal or anything. Um, it's hard, but like you have to be open. And if if those supervisors don't get it, like just try, try to put it in perspective of who they are and where they are and um, it'll be okay. And your happiness is more important than anything. At least that reminded me of something actually um, I'll, I'll share, share this quickly. Um, like, you know, for me, the difficult part was as well, you know, once you leave academia, there's no way you're getting back. Right. So it's kind of that idea, but I love to teach, you know, I love being in the classroom. I'm, I'm alive too, as well. Like I love, I love that aspect of, of the work that we do. Right. And, um, you know, it was always that, that, that was the, the balancing act of, of, of doing that, you know, like I, I, if I leave, I'm not going to come back. And I have to be willing to take that that risk. But I think what's clear that, you know, that's also a myth of sorts, clearly because Emma is back <laughs> in academia, right, uh, on, on, on one hand. And, um, you know, for, uh, I guess, Marianne, you also missed this part too, like in, in Letha sharing, uh, um, you know, being an adjunct at U of T. And I'm also an adjunct um, at a, an online university with my, you know, my, my, you know, I still have a toe in the pond um, and, you know, just affiliated, right. I'm not, um, you know, if, if I ever wanted to make that transition back, um, I probably could, right. Because I still have that, you know, that opportunity, but I kept that door open because of the stuff that I love in academia, right. Just if, if I'm able just to teach and to, to, you know, to, to, to have really great conversations with students. That's the stuff that I miss uh, quite frankly, right? Like I miss those conversations with students, but I have great conversations and collaborations with my colleagues at work that are also challenging and also making me think differently about, you know, the, uh, you know, to Emma's point earlier about like the, you know, things being narrow, they're very wide. There's the, you know, the, there's, there's many ways of, of, of looking uh, at things and things, the, the door really does open. So that was something as part of my, again, my identity crisis, as I like to call it, um, was like, you know, I, uh, I don't want to leave because I'm not going to come back. Um, and if I don't come back, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm losing out on that part of my life that I love. So that's why I, you know, um, I think it's possible, you know, to, to balance it as best as, 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 you know, as, uh, as you can, uh, if opportunities present themselves for sure. Just being very cognizant of the time. <laughs> we're actually right now. Actually have to Can I just add all. one uh, one point, Lisa, Walter? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I just want to say that I think academics, you know, nobody 
ever said this out loud to me, but I think everybody kind of has this impression that the only place for an intellectual life is in the academy. The only place to have serious conversations, the only place to talk to like smart, driven, like in-depth, knowledgeable people. It's absolutely not true. Uh, you know, like almost all of my colleagues that I work with on a daily basis are absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, they're incredibly engaged, they're smart, uh, they're compassionate, uh, they're interesting, and um, they're, they're not, I don't feel like any less stimulated than I did as an academic. And in some, in some ways I feel more stimulated because, you know, I don't have to like answer 10 questions about the syllabus every hour. Um, so, yeah. I, I love the, the conversation we've been having and I, I hate to actually have to wear that hot hat and go, oh, we're almost out of time. We're almost out of time. Uh, what, one, one final thought coming, coming off of this is just like we, we've had this weird idea for so long in, in the academic space that the only real role is academia. Well, clearly it isn't. Clearly there's, there's things in the public or the private sector that, that we're very well suited for and in high demand for. But I'm also wondering, especially with the comment that, that Joseph was just making of this idea of once you leave, you can't come back. Where did this come from? Where did this come from? I, I think it's it, in some ways connected to the thing of that idea that the only role is academic. Like, well, if, if you do decide to do something else, you're not welcome back. You're never going to be able to come back, which I mean, that was a fallacy. Uh, I, Emma, you, you've come back and have the, the I have to say, I think it is back. actually true for tenure track roles. I, I don't think it's, it's not true for like adjunct roles and for like other kind of interesting things, but I think because with the way the tenure track market is, um, I mean, it goes to say that, you know, a lot of, you know, departments are really only want really, really fresh PhDs. And they say, you know, if you've been out of your PhD for so many years, or you've done too many postdocs, they're not even, they're going to put you in the no pile. I think, you know, if I were to apply, you know, to a tenure track job, and they saw that I had a tenure track position, and left of my own accord, they're going to be like, this is a loose cannon, there's no way. There's well, no I, way they're going to invest. I, I wonder then also, is it maybe something specific to our field that we that this thought is there? Because I, I have one colleague who did his PhD, went off, spent almost eight years as a government scientist. He got <laughs> different story than you guys. <laughs> he actually got sick and tired of what he was doing there and wanted to come back. And he's now uh, in a tenured stream at Western, but it's not an answer at all. I would so, say... So I, I think that it depends on a couple of things. Um, so I've coming back into the academic orbit through the work I do at Rotman, but it's a professional program. So I'm not, I'm showing up as someone who has relevant industry experience um, and can offer training and capacity building for people, you know, in a business school context. Could I eventually grow into like a full-time tenure track, if I started publishing again in academic journals, um, if I started getting back into the academic um, sort of route of credentialization, then I think I could, but I couldn't come back to the anthropology department. I think I could potentially like really ensconce myself at Rotman, which I'm not even sure I want to, um, unless the only other thing is the thing I do now, I understand is called design anthropology. And as more and more departments create subfields for design anthropology, someone like me might have an opportunity to get a tenure track role there, but I would have to definitely keep my, um, publishing up, up, um, so, uh, Dory Tunstall, who is a design anthropologist, um, she has been the dean of the Graduate School of Design at OCAD U for like the past five years. And she was an academic who went out, was in industry, worked at Sapient for many years, had a consulting life, and then came back in. Um, it can be done, but usually you have to land in a di slightly different place than where you left, I think. This this may actually be the, the good part to, to stop in and think of, 
hey, maybe we could have a narrow one. He's to continue this very particular conversation. There were a number of other questions that I have written down, but we never got to put them down just in case the audience said, thank God the audience had questions because it made my job so much easier. I want to thank the audience for, for, for joining us today and to all three of the panelists. Unfortunately, Graham had to, had to skip out early family issues that fully understand well it's life right uh but i want to give a, a huge shout out and thanks to letha emma and joseph for for being here and and sharing their thoughts sharing their experiences uh, especially to those of us who are just at that stage of what do we do next so thank you all for for an enjoyable informative discussion thanks very much so nice to see you all yeah thanks for thanks. having me Thanks, Thanks for having me. Nice to see you all. You as well. Thanks. Bye, everyone.